Okay, it is a manic Monday here on Asia Confidential. I'm Bernie in Hong Kong. Our guest today, a good friend of mine who wears many hats, Lawrence Brom, author of the Anti-Globalization Breakfast Club, also entrepreneur, political columnist, activist, and economist. There's a lot of jobs wrapped up into one. Here's his book right here, by the way. It's really, really colorful. I still haven't finished yet. He uses a lot of big words. I'm just kidding, Lawrence. Later on, he is here on AC with us today. Hello, sir. How are you? The world can wait 10, 15, 20 years for some uh, agreement on a, on a successor to, to Kyoto. Well, there's, there are scientists who are now estimating that if we don't do something about climate change very quickly, that really by the year 2035, 70% of the Himalayan glaciers will be gone. Now, if that happens, half of humanity has no water to drink because the major river systems in China, the Yellow Yangtze River, the Brahmaputra, Ganges, Indus in, in South Asia, and even Southeast Asia, the Irrawaddy, the Mekong, the Salween River, all have their source from the Himalayan glaciers. And with CO2 emissions at current trajectories, if the glaciers reach tip point, mm -hmm. and again, we're looking 20 years out for major catastrophe and a lot of catastrophe beforehand, Half of humanity has no water. We are living in a global village, a village in which resources are finite and less and less as we talk. And there we, for we need to adopt some village values, values of compassion, caring not only for ourselves but also for others. We have the technology, we have the ability to be able to reduce CO2, to be able to move toward green energy. Mm -hmm. But that's going to require two things. It's going to require corporations mm -hmm. to, 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 to join on the bandwagon, and it's mm -hmm. going to require governments to have the policies that will incentivize the corporations to do that. And right now, the corporate lobbying system in governments, both in America and in China, is not in that direction. Mm -hmm. It's not supporting green technology. It's actually supporting a prolongation of the current situation. It's also political. Mm -hmm. In America, you, you know, the reality is that the leadership has to tell people our lifestyle, mm -hmm. the way we live, is no longer sustainable in a planet of shrinking global resources. At the same time, for China, its whole program of social stability is built upon massive infrastructure spending stimulus packages to create yep. jobs almost artificially, which are both consuming resources at trajectories mm -hmm. that the rest of the planet cannot. Yesterday, sustain. Lawrence Brom is a good, very good friend of mine, a key driver behind the Himalayan consensus, an alternative global framework to what is now known as the Washington consensus. If you've been watching a few programs that Lawrence and I've been doing, you know that we don't agree on all the fine print, but it makes for healthy conversations. When you're talking and debating, that can be healthy if you're listening to the other side. In the wake of the global financial crisis, have things changed much? Have they changed enough for a new world order uh, to occur, so to speak? Lawrence, what uh, we're going to, as time, you know what, the calendar and the clock is unrelenting. It doesn't matter where you are, what you're feeling, how old you are, anything, it is agnostic to everything that goes around. Here we are, we've got a fresh new year coming around the horizon. Describe the kind of landscape that well, we'll be heading into. The global tectonic plates have shifted. Mm -hmm. Our economics are in the process of changing. Uh, values are also changing as well. We see this with, the, with Copenhagen. We see this with the massive protests that are coming out calling for uh, you know, leaders in government to do something about climate change. And we see the rise of regionalism. We see the rise of organizations like BRIC you know, that are bringing together Brazil, India, uh, Russia, China together into new amalgamations. We're seeing a return to localization. And we're even seeing this within the U.S. We're seeing a retrenchment from the idea of promoting a kind of a global one standard across the world and seeking local standards, local approaches, indigenous approaches to be able to have a sustainable future. And I think this is what we're going to see in 210. Mm -hmm. This sounds like a complete extrication or withdrawal from the trends which have been in play for much of this generation. This is like the hunter-gatherer, your community kind of approach. Um, like we don't want to trade with halfway around the world because it doesn't pay to burn that much carbon to do that trade. So think community. This is, it sounds almost like Walden. You'll forgive me for saying that, right? Well, in some ways it is. We are leaving a decade of excessiveness. We're leaving a decade of excessiveness on Wall Street driven by a neoliberal economic approach that says that everything is driven by greed. Greed alone will balance equalize markets. And you know, we, we have to have complete information 
to have markets equalized. But of course, information doesn't exist, particularly in developing countries. Mm -hmm. And as the gaps get wider, people are thinking twice. Is our life measured by materialism? Is it measured by how, how many brands we have? Do these global brands define our identity? Or is there something more? And that emotional perception is driven by an economic reality. Mm -hmm. the, the system of consumption, of growth, of neoliberal economics, which drove the past decade, mm -hmm. collapsed a year ago. It collapsed in September 2008. And with that, in the wake of that, we see a rise of regionalism, we see a rise of local solutions, and we see a lot less political and political rhetoric across the board. Countries are seeking their own solutions. Uh, you see South America now be very much driven by Brazil. Mm. Uh, Asia is being very much driven by China and India. And in turn, much of Europe and America are undergoing a rethink, a rethink of values, and are turning more and more green. And this we see by the protesters who are um, on the street in Copenhagen, who are angry at the inability of government to be able to provide for the future, to be able to provide a single resource for our future, not oil, but water. The protesters and the mindset which you highlight here are still are the distinct minority. Are they not? This does not represent the overwhelming majority of people it in is, this global But society. now it is an increasing voice, and the voice can be heard louder than before. And to a great extent, this, this sort of populist voice began, of course, in, 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 in 1998 in Seattle with WTO protests and has continued with what has been called the anti-globalization movement. That This movement is not against globalization per se. They are against the globalization of one standard, of one value which encroaches upon people's lifestyle, life quality. And in turn, this or, or this, this organized or actually very disorganized set of organized movements is coming together on the climate change issue. It is now having one voice mm -hmm. on one issue and that is real climate change. Address this issue before we don't have a planet to live on. Don't continue to create derivatives and all kinds of different mechanisms to allow the industrialized nations to continue their CO2 emissions while transferring the problem to the south. Mm -hmm. and in this case, you see a new set of values. People are more concerned about their environment. You know, what is the use of having all kinds of, you know, toys and lots of money and lots of wealth and lots of houses if when you step out of your house, if you step out of your Mercedes, you're breathing polluted air. What use is it to have lots of money and worry about your, 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 your um, global markets if you don't have clean water to give your children to drink? Mm -hmm. And this is no longer sort of a, a kind of a beatnik hippies crying. This is actually a real phenomenon. Scientists are looking at, they're saying that uh, our future ahead of us is very, very, very bleak. Mm -hmm. And so what's going to happen is values will change. Those values will drive corporations. Corporations are going to have to think about their products, not necessarily mm -hmm. being um, for, for consumption of brands, they're not going to necessarily think about their P&L and their shareholders' value. They've got to think about whether they're providing stakeholders' values. People will vote with their money. They're going to buy products. They're going to buy services mm -hmm. which contribute to the society, mm -hmm. to the environmental protection, to the sustainability sure. of long-term economics. doesn't matter how much money you have. There are some things you can't buy your way out of in this world. And I guess that's just one example. You can get out of a Ferrari, you can live in a 50 million square foot home, but the air you share with everybody.